We've discussed the first creation account in Genesis chapter 1, and the second creation account, as we've already talked about in these videos, is connected to it. It's not a competing account, but it develops the pattern of the first creation account in a different realm. It's like the movement from a satellite view to a street view. And on this ground level of the street view of creation itself, when we see the formlessness and void of the world, the world is watered by this mist or this surge that comes up from the earth and covers the whole face of the earth. What we see on the third day, or the events that stand in the position of the third day of creation, is this garden from which rivers come out. And these rivers go into the earth and they divide the lands from each other, and these lands are then named. So this movement from an unwatered, this land that's just generically watered by this mist that comes up and covers the whole surface of it, is replaced by these waters that go out from a garden and give a sense of geographic place, a sense of specific locations like the land of Havilah, which is associated with its gold. And these other rivers that go out enable you to divide out the land. It gathers together the land in specific realms. We see this elsewhere in scripture, the significance of water boundaries. These water boundaries that give the land its definition. Israel's existence was defined by the crossing of waters, by being brought out of waters. In the previous video, I noted the significant connection between the concept of the dry land as it appears in the third day of the creation and the significance that it has in Israel being brought out of the waters as Israel is brought through the dry land of the Red Sea that is divided by God's power. This is something that we see in the prophets as well as they draw attention back to this event. Isaiah in chapter 63 verse 11 writes, Then his people remember the days of old of Moses. Where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherds of his flock? Where is he who put his Holy Spirit in the midst of them, who caused his glorious arm to go at the right hand of Moses, who divided the waters before them to make for himself an everlasting name? These are significant allusions back to the creation account in a way that presents the Exodus account within the framework and the terminology of the creation. Israel being brought up out of the water is Israel being brought up out of the nations. Israel being brought up out of the water of the Red Sea is Israel entering into the experience of Moses who was drawn up out of the water. This is the creation of land, a creation of a realm of habitation, of presence, of life, out of a realm of disorder which has not yet been ordered and structured, made habitable. And God forming his people is a third day act. It is one of the events by which God establishes a new world, a realm within which he can dwell with his people. We see further themes along this line in the story of the flood, where there is a decreation as the boundaries of the waters are broken down. The floodgates of the heavens open, the fountains of the deep are broken up, the waters of the seas overwhelm the land, and in all these surging waters, we lose the order, we lose the place, we lose the security that comes with the dry land. And God's creation is thrown back into this original situation that you see at the very beginning of the creation account in Genesis chapter 1. Elsewhere, as we move through the scripture, we see these things fleshed out further. The relationship between the land and the sea is the relationship between Israel and the nations. The nations are like the sea. They are connected with the sea, with sea creatures. In the book of Daniel, we see beasts arising out of the sea. We see Israel surrounded by these other nations, which threaten to overwhelm it. If God does not maintain the boundaries of his land, it will be overwhelmed by the waters of the nations, the Assyrians, the Babylonians. These forces that exist around Israel are held at bay by God's power, the same power that holds the seas at bay and prevents the land from being overwhelmed. These polarities that we see within the first three days of creation are significant. We see the polarity between light and dark. We see the polarity between the waters above and the waters beneath. And now we see the polarity between land and sea. 
And within these polarities, these binary states, we see an understanding of how the people of God, how the purpose of God plays out. It's a stage for God's purpose. And within this stage, we have, as things are associated with one polarity or another, there is a tension, there is an antagonism. There is also a realm that's demarcated, which is characterized by movement and interplay. The waters meet the land at certain points. There is a connection between the waters above and the waters beneath through the cycles of rain, for instance. Or we see this connection between light and dark as this succession of the day following the light and the daytime. This relation is also something that we see in the relationship between the waters and the land. Elsewhere in scripture we see the ways in which the waters can become a site where land-like things exist. Just as the land can be a place of waters with the lakes, with the rivers, there is an interplay between these two realms. In the New Testament there is a lot of emphasis upon boats, upon fishing, upon venturing out upon the sea, venturing out upon the sea in parts of the dry land that are taken out. And as we think about these things in our next video, we'll explore some of the significance of this for our understanding of what it means to be the church.